everyone. Uh, my name is Liora Hendelman Bavur, and I'm the director of the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University. This is the, the second session of our series of online panels covering different aspects of the Iran-Iraq war four decades after its outbreak. Uh, in organizing this series and hosting this evening's panel, I'm joined by my colleagues Ronen Zaidel, a researcher of Iraq at the Moshe Dayan Center and task team member at the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policies, Mitvim. We are hosting today very distinguished guest speakers, um, IDF retired Colonel Pesach Malovani, a, a senior intelligence analyst. He is the author of Wars of Modern Babylon, a history of the Iraqi army from 1921 till 2003 published by the University Press of Kentucky. He also have authored three books in Hebrew and co-edited two more uh, about the Iraqi and Syrian army. And he authored uh, many, many articles on the subject. I must confess that I became acquainted with his writing through uh, an article in a journal, Marachot, about the Iraqi invasion uh, to Khorem Shah. And today uh, we will hear a little bit more about uh, the Iraqi army that they, than the Iranian case. But the Islamic revolution brought about the disintegration of the army in Iran. But disturbing signs already started to show troubling signs earlier on. Uh, in 1974, five high-ranking officers, including three generals from the ground forces, were uh, tried for corruption. In, two, uh, in uh, 1976, the former head of the Navy and his deputy were sentenced to five years imprisonment for bribery. Uh, the Shah's power over the armed forces was exercised through weapons uh, procurement, which overrelated with uh, the aims of his foreign policy and his relations with the United States. Now, relating to the Shah's uh, obsessive armament, uh, an American advisor observed in, in uh, the 1970s that uh, in Iran, the Shah insisted on supporting an expensive military that was too large for border incidents and internal security and of no use in all out war. His military resembled the proverbial man who was too heavy to do any light work and too light to do any heavy work. Now the Iranian army in comparison to other countries in the region like India, Pakistan, Israel, and some Arab countries did not have combat experience. And according to foreign observers, uh, they were relying heavily on the massive equipment at their disposal. But this created also many problems of dependency in both Western trainers and spare parts. In addition to these problems, during the long uh, year of the revolution in 1979, the Iranian armed forces went through a purge. Following the Iraqi invasion in September uh, 1980, the process of uh, Islamization and reorganizing the armed forces continued. Alongside the purge, the regime set out to create the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, uh, also known as the Pasdaran or the Sepa, uh, to counterbalance the armed forces. And as a result, by the summer of 1981, the purging of the army was reappraised. Scores of high-ranking officers and several hundreds of lower-ranked officers who had been retired or imprisoned especially the desperately needed pilots, were permitted to return to their duties and participate in the defense of the country. I'll uh, have a separate and in-depth discussion on the Revolutionary Guards in a later panel, so we will not get into uh, this topic today. I will just say, and I'm sure that uh, Ronen, you can uh, agree with me, that many of the key figures in Iran's politics and administrative positions today are veterans of the Iran-Iraq war. Some of them no longer with us, like uh, Qasem Soleimani, but there are many others whose career was shaped by the war, like former president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, Mohsen Rezaei, who is nowadays the secretary of the Expediency uh, Discernment Coun Council, um, and there are uh, many others. Like I would like to first start with you, uh, Pesach, if I may. Um, 
How did you uh, uh, learn about the war? Or Three months before the war started, in June 1980, I was nominated as head of the Iraqi branch in our military intelligence. And I was asking myself what I'm going to do there, because many, many subjects were already discussed and researched, and uh, there were not much uh, new things to, to do. And uh, here we are very quickly in a series of, of clashes between the Iraqis and the Iranians on the border. And uh, one day we got uh, the newspapers from uh, Baghdad. And one day, uh, one of my officers brought me uh, the newspaper to show me pictures of Iraqi soldiers who are uh, celebrating the, the, that they took uh, one of the Iranian uh, strongholds, strong points. And I, uh, because I know also the, the language, I read uh, what is written there. And I found uh, interviews with uh, Iraqi officers from different units. And uh, since it, I, I asked him to bring me every day the, the newspaper, the new uh, newspaper. And I started to, uh, to, to write down uh, the, those uh, interviews by units. And very quickly, I found that at least 10 of the uh, Iraqi divisions are now out of their uh, permanent camps and deployed along the border with uh, uh, Iran, which uh, shows uh, that there is something going on and maybe there is an intention that these divisions, most of them were our divisions, but not only, uh, are prepared to uh, open uh, a war with Iran. And uh, after a few days, it really happened. It was, a surprise. it was a surprise for me and for our organization also, as well it was a surprise for the whole world, because as I remember, uh, nobody knew uh, or had a, a sign that uh, such a thing is going to happen. And uh, later it, it uh, was prolonged for long eight years of war. Can you tell us uh, about the uh, development, the major developments from the military side. Okay, I want. Mm -hmm. I, I prepared. I prepared a, a lecture about okay. it, and I will. I will tell you about it. Just a few days ago, I lectured on another war in the area that preceded the Iran-Iraq War, uh, the Yom Kippur War, or the October 1973 war, which we currently marking 47 years since. And now I will present the longest war that had taken place in our region so far, and its impact on the region is evident to this day. I would say that the Iraqi preparations toward the military conflict with Iran started after the Ba'ath Revolution of July 1968, when Bakr and Saddam came to power. They brought about a reversal in the traditional Iraqi perception of the military's place in the country and its national functions, and created a change of historical significance in its development. For the first time, the Iraqi leadership sought to neutralize the military from engaging in domestic politics so that it would no longer pose a risk to the regime and to devote all national resources to build an impressive military power to be weighed against external enemies. Until then, the Iraqi army was deployed in wars against Israel by sending expeditionary forces in 1948 and 1967 and fighting against the Kurdish rebellion in the north of Iraq. Since the rise of the Ba'ath regime, and especially since Saddam Hussein himself became president in 1979, the regime had made extensive use of military, not only against Israel during the war in the Golan Heights in the 1973 war, but mainly against its neighbors, Iran and Kuwait. Saddam's vision was to bring Iraq to its glorious days from the times of the Babylonian Empire kings, Hammurabi and Nebuchadnezzar, and the Abbasid caliphs, and became the leading power in the Arab world instead of Egypt that abandoned the path of struggle against Israel by signing with it a peace treaty. The strategic decision of the Ba'ath leaders to change the army's role raised the development of military power to the top national priority. As a result, during the period before the war against Iran, there was a tremendous and unprecedented strengthening of the armed forces to an extent not previously known in the region by investing a great effort to equip them with advanced weapons, establishing new formations, and improving its capabilities. The architect of this development was Saddam Hussein, 
who acted as deputy commander in, in chief of the armed forces during El Bakr's presidency and later as commander in chief as he became president. Up to the war against Israel in 1973, the Iraqi army contained six divisions only, two of them armored and the others infantry. Since the beginning of 1974, the Iraqis were busy in building much more divisions, three new armored and three new infantry, while two former infantry divisions were converted to be mechanized divisions. On the eve of the war, the Iraqi army included 12 divisions, seven of them armored and mechanized, commanded by three new corps headquarters, each responsible for a separate sector along the border with Iran. This clearly indicates the Iraqis' intention to build an offensive army capable of mobility and propelling its forces over great distances and quickly. A similar int intensification was also performed in the air arm. Iraq was on its way to become a leading regional power. In addition, it has simultaneously invested considerable efforts in building a technological and scientific infrastructure, focusing on the construction of a nuclear research reactor purchased from France, which was designed to enable it to build a nuclear weapon stockpile as well. The Iranian Islamic regime posed a threat to Iraq and its regime, and the Iraqi leadership saw an opportunity to open a war against Iran at this point in order to solve its problems with Iran in its favor, before the Iranian threat to it will become greater and more powerful. On the eve of the war against Iran, Saddam and the Iraqi leadership assumed that their military power would be enough for them to defeat Iran, whose army was, as was mentioned, weakened after the Islamic revolution and the overthrow of the Shah regime, and embarked on the adventure of a war against Iran. On the 22nd of September 1980, Iraq attacked Iran, surprisingly, and her forces crossed the border into Iranian territory. The war got the name Qadusiya Saddam by the Iraqis as a direct link to the former victorious war of the Arabs against Iranians in the 7th century that was called Qadusiya Saad after the famous military commander Saad ibn, Ab ibn Abi Waqas. On the eve of the war, the Iraqi army faced a complex and difficult challenge. Despite its strength, more than 2,000 tanks and 300 fighter jets, most of them Soviet-made, its operational experience was limited, amounting to fighting against the irregular Kurdish forces and against the IDF in the war in 1973. This fighting was not similar to the expected war against the Iranian army, who was considered a powerful army until the fall, the fall of the Shah. During the year before the war, the Iraqi ground forces completed a series of training according to the annual training program, which included headquarters and troop exercises at all levels. The Iraqi leadership and its top military command were sure their army had an advantage over the Iranian opponent, not only in quantity and quality, but also in morale of the troops and in their readiness to fight. However, the development of the war between the two sides proved, as in many other cases, the famous sentence related to the Russian Field Marshal from Moltke the Elder, no military plan survives first contact with the enemy. The war again, the war began with a widespread airstrike on the main Iranian Air Force bases in imitation of the Israeli attack on the Egyptian Air Force in 1967 war, with the intention of destroying a significant portion of the Iranian Air Force aircraft and preventing its intervention on the battlefield. The attack was unsuccessful and already that day, dozens of Iranian planes attacked various targets in Iraq. Immediately afterwards, 10, as I mentioned, 10 Iraqi divisions began invading Iran, five of which were armored and mechanized into Khuzestan region in the south, which was the main <coughs> target of the Iraqi attack, and five others, three of them infantry, into central Iraq to control the main access coming from Iran to, into Iraq. In two sectors, the Iraqis remained in defense, in Kurdistan in the north, deploying their few forces, and in the south, defending their shores with their small navy. The attack surprised the Iranian leadership and the army as well. The army used to be, in the times of the Shah, a very powerful army, which was suppo supposed to face the Soviet army. But after the Islamic revolution, Iraqi and Western intelligence agencies assessed 
that its combat capability was severely damaged and was less than 40% compared to the Shah period. The most severe damage was done to Iran's powerful air force that was reduced from about 500 advanced combat aircraft, all Western-made types, Phantom F-4s and Tomcat F-14s, to less than 200, according to intelligence sources, mainly because of the Western weapon embargo imposed on Iran after the revolution. The Iranian ground forces included nine divisions, four of them armored and the rest infantry. Two of the armored divisions were deployed on the eve of the war in Western Iran, one, the 81st, in Kerman Shah, facing the central sector with Iraq, and the other, the 92nd, in Ahwaz, in Kurdistan. All the others were deployed in different locations over the country, mostly in the depths. The ground forces were also equipped with Western-made weapons, more than 1,000 British chieftain tanks, and a similar number of few United States M48 and M68 tanks. The main favorable terrain for tank battles was in Kurdistan, but with many water obstacles and marshes, while the central sector was mostly a hilly to a mountainous area and was more suitable for infantry operations. The Revolutionary Guards were at the beginning of their build-up and were involved mostly in internal activity, especially to strengthen the new Islamic regime and its control in Iran against opposition elements. During the development of the war, they became a separate and powerful army by itself. The Iranian Navy was not hurt by, by the revolution and was the dominant power in the Persian uh, or Arab Gulf, depends which side you, you call it. This was the situation on which the Iraqi leadership based its decision that this is the most appropriate time to launch a war against Iran, as the new regime and the Iranian army were not ready for it and before the regime would strengthen its military capability in, in military capability. In addition, that Iran's international position was severely damaged after the revolution, and its former allies, the United States, Britain, and France, became now its enemies. The Iranians were surprised by the Iraqi move and reacted badly at the beginning. At first, the Iraqi forces did not encounter any serious resistance from the <coughs> few Iranian forces deployed along the border. It seems that victory on Iran was within reach. The first time the Iraqis invading forces encountered severe resistance was in the city of Khoramshar in the south, which turned into a difficult and bloody battle in a build-up area environment. Later, the Iraqis suffered an important failure to take the city of Abadan, east of Khoramshar. This actually was the end of the first stage of the war. As the war continued beyond the schedule that the Iraqis planned and the difficulties grew up, Saddam realized that he was mistaken and that the war was going to be long and steady. He tried to propose ceasefire, but the Iranians showed stubbornness and refused. The Iraqis were caught between their inability to advance and achieve further achievements and the Iranian refusal to stop the war. A problematic situation they didn't consider in their planning, which caused them to uh, start uh, uh, preparing for it by recruiting more manpower, mostly reservists, to establish additional forces they needed and to acquire additional weapons. Their training bases were full of manpower trained for joining the battlefield. The Iranians also began to organize themselves against the Iraqi invasion, recruiting manpower and launching a series of counterattacks in order to stop the Iraqi forces. They started to build a new army, as I mentioned, the Revolutionary Guard, in parallel with the regular army, whose fighters were full of religious and national enthusiasm. In January 1981, a new phase began in which the Iranians took over the initiative and began to increase gradually their pressure on the Iraqi forces by launching extensive attack on them in both sectors. <coughs> While on the land area arena, the Iranians were successful, their ability in the air and sea air arenas were, was weakening. During a year and a half, up to June 1982, the Iranians initiated more than 10 major attacks in different sectors, which required them to invest a great effort in preparing those operations. It was a bad sign for the Iraqis about the future to come. The Iraqis did not 
assess properly what is expect, expected to happen and the enormous efforts made by the Iranians to remove their invading forces from Iranian territory. After some failures in the field, the Iranians started to gain victories. In September 1981, they managed to achieve their first victory, lifting the Iraqi siege on Abadan and re reoccupying territories in other sectors. These warning signs pointed out that the war is facing a strategic turn. After intensive preparations, the Iranian launched in spring 1982 their strategic offensive in Kurdistan, which after three months of hard fighting, succeeded to inflict a heavy and painful defeat on the Iraqi forces and liberated most of Kurdistan from their presence. Saddam then decided to withdraw all his forces from all Iranian territories and cities to their former positions along the international border between the two countries. He suggested again a ceasefire and ignited a new war in the area, in Lebanon, by attempted assassination of the Israeli ambassador in London and tried to persuade the Iranians to end the war between them and instead sent their armies to fight a common enemy, Israel, that invaded into Lebanon. The Iranians did not accept his gesture and decided to continue the war in order to exploit their last great victim. Now starts the third phase of the war that lasted longer than five years and was characterized by the great number of attacks into Iraqi territory along their common border, focusing on the Basra area, which was the Iranian strategic target. It shows that the determination of Khomeini to win this war and punish Saddam for his mistake to attack Iran and the new regime. In a very miraculous way, the Iraqi army performed now different and better than it did in the previous battles on Iranian soil and defended stubbornly against those attacks. During this phase, the Iraqis introduced new elements into the war, the use of chemical weapons against the Iranian attacking forces and the war against Iran's economy, especially its oil industry and export system. Iraqi decision was at this phase to perform a defensive strategy, leaving the offensive initiative in the hands of the Iranians in order to exhaust their forces by causing them as many losses as possible and damaging severely the economic infrastructure and thus bring an end to the war. This strategy was also intended to reduce the extent of the Iraqi army's casualties. They emphasized that the Iraqi army succeeded to thwart all Iranian efforts to bring into Iraqi territory, especially in the Basra and Southern sector. The army succeeded to overcome the trauma it suffered as a result of the defeat and casualties had suffered a year earlier in Kurdistan, and that Iraq has gained broader international and regional support in its war against Iran. This was reflected, among other things, in the large quantities of advanced weapons of all kinds which Iraq obtained from various sources, while Iran was in almost complete isolation and had difficulties finding sources of supplies for weapons and spare parts, which it needed <coughs> to continue fighting. The Iranians tried their luck in new sectors in the Kurdish mountains in the north, with the intention to reignite the Kurdish revolt, and also in the oasis lands in the south, where the Iraqis defenses were thinner, but didn't achieve much success in both. In addition, the war of the cities between the two sides was intensified after it was renewed following the withdrawal of Iraqi forces to the international border. The Iraqi war against Iran economy caused a sharp decrease in Iranian income from oil export. And the Iranians who began to feel the economic suffocation tighten around their necks decided to respond by threatening uh, to prevent oil export from the Gulf in general and attacking Saudi Arabia and Kuwaiti ports, oil facilities, and other vital targets in these countries, hoping to end the Iraqis' blockade on its oil export. They also scattered mines in various places in the Gulf and in the Red Sea. The unsuccessful attacks exhausted Iranian forces. The number of casualties increased to a daily average of 300 killed at the end of 1984. The Iranian armor was eroded and most of the attacks were carried out by Iranian infantry, human waves, would be called. The Iranian air force also weakened 
It, in contrast, the Iraqis grew stronger. Their air force was concentrated in bombing of strategic and quality targets in the depths of Iran, particularly oil targets, in order to increase pressure on Iran and its economy. The beginning of 1986 brought with it a turning point, as Iran succeeded to invade the Al-Fawr Peninsula in the southern edge of Iraq. This was due to an intelligence failure and a miscalculation of the Iraqi high command. The Iranians took the opportunity due to the fact that this sector was left with very few defending forces. This surprising development it became one of the most important strategic developments in this war, and one of the most difficult and blood settled battles that took place in it, and became one of the most prominent Iraqi symbols of war. Nearly 53,000 Iraqi soldiers were killed in the fighting to return El Fawr to Iraq. The losses of the Iranians were even heavier. The Iranians' success in the topic is a topic of, their, of this space and marks the end of it and the beginning of the fourth and last phase of the war. From then on, the Iraqis were busy to prepare themselves to expel the Iranians from the El Fawr Peninsula, while the Iranians still believed they could win the war, declaring the decisive year and preparing for the million-strong offensive in Iraq in a series of attacks called Karbala. After the Shiite holy city in Iraq, most of which were carried out during that decisive year. This was the peak of the Iranian effort in the long war designed to defeat the Iraqi army and achieve their strategic goals in it. Iraq took very seriously Iran's new threats and began to prepare for them while preparing for the campaign to liberate the Alfa Peninsula. Most of their fears were of a surprising Iranian move towards Baghdad, in addition to massive attacks in the south for the occupation of Basra. In December 1986, the first attack, Karbala 4, took place in the Basra sector, which was an introduction to the next and largest attack, Karbala 5, that was launched in January 1987. The force concentrated for this operation numbered over half a million fighters, which was the largest that the Iranian concentrated to carry out during their decisive year. Despite their extensive preparation for this campaign, which was supported, supposed to be, in their view, the decisive attack of the war, with tens of thousands of fighters storming towards their targets, accompanied by shouts of Allahu Akbar by clergymen who accompanied them to strengthen their morale, this dream soon shattered and the Iranians expected a severe surprise. They found the Iraqi forces were well prepared for this move and successfully withhold this massive surge of infantry masses that attacked them. The enormous fire from ground and air the Iraqis used in this campaign caused a huge killing among the Iranian forces, which led the Iraqis to call it the Great Harvest Campaign. The campaign, which lasted about three weeks of fire fighting, caused the most widespread carnage among Iranian forces. At least 80,000 dead, including hundreds of commanders of various ranks, and about 150,000 to 200,000 wounded, according to, Iraq, to the Iraqis, who described the Iranian defeat as a heavy disaster for Iran and warned its leaders from making another attempt to infiltrate Iraqi territory. The major campaigns initiated by the Iranians in the Basra sector from December 1986 to April 1987, only five months uh, uh, in, at all, caused them, according to the Iraqis, the largest casualty numbers in any campaign since the beginning of the war, more than 400,000 killed and wounded, in addition to the material losses and the effect on the fighting spirit of the troops until the end of the war. The Karbala 5 campaign may have been the great and last Iranian hope in this war to reach a decision in their favor, but it turned from a victory campaign into an extremely severe defeat in which they suffered the heaviest losses since the beginning of the war. It was the most decisive battle in the entire war, which brought about a change in its course and to its end in a crushing Iraqi victory. 
The result of this campaign led to an end to the extensive Iranian attacks as they had done until then. Saddam even informed the nation uh, uh, that the slogan decisive here no longer exists as Iraq had managed to shatter its this plan. The Iranian defeat also led to a deepening rift between the political leadership and the military command, which together with the entire Iranian people wondered where this uh, was leading them. Against this background, demonstrations took place in Iran and the number of volunteers for the Revolution of Guards was significantly, significantly reduced. Thus, the Iranians lost their great advantage over Iraq, the human resources mobilized for war on a large scale. The inability to mobilize and concentrate large forces has led to a significant reduction in Iran's combat capability late in, later in the war and the scope of operation it could carry out. The dire consequences in the major campaign in the Basra sector, more than anything else, expressed the failure of the Iranian effort to bring about the decision of the war in the decision decisive year. On the other hand, it was a victory for Iraqi strategy, which aimed to harm Iran's main elements of power, its economy, its manpower resources, and national morale, and at the same time increased Iraqi power. The severe damage to human sources joined the severe damage to the Iranian economy, which at the end of the decisive year was completely devastated. The Iraqis continued to increase, to increase their power and operational capabilities by producing new and advanced weapons in all arms, mainly in the Air Force. They increased the order of battle of the ground forces, especially of the Republican Guard, their elite force that was upgraded to the level of an army corps and acted as their strategic reserve that played a crucial role in their victories at the end of the war. The prolongation of the war and the escalation of Iranian activity against the Gulf states that supported Iraq in response to Iraqi attacks on their oil infrastructure led to international involvement in the war, mainly by the United States, whose forces even acted against Iranian targets in the Gulf. Political efforts to end the war were also intensified, culminating in Security Council Resolution 598 of July 1987, which called for an immediate ceasefire, but the Iranians remained adamant in their uncompromising stance, resuming new activities in the Kurdish region, which the help of Kurdish opposition elements. This led to the tragic event of the Iraqi chemical attack of the town of Khalabja in March 1988, which became famous all over the world. The war of the cities between the parties intensified also at this time, after the Iraqis managed to develop a surface to surface missile with a range of more than 600 kilometers, which they launched to Tehran and other cities during February, March 1988. The Iranians did not remain indebted and fired SCAD missiles, which they obtained from foreign sources to Baghdad and other Iraqi cities. On April 17, 1988, Iraq began to inflict its last blow of grace on the Iranian army and revolutionary guards in a series of six successful operations, which lasted until July 1988, in which they regained control on all the territories captured by the Iranians in their attacks into Iraqi territory, first and foremost on the Al-Fawl Peninsula, thus regaining their honor damaged by the Iranian takeover of part of, its, of it in early 1986. It was the Iraqi army victorious operations that eventually led to the collapse of the Iranian forces in, in, at the front and to the end of the war, exactly at the same point where it had began eight years earlier. All of these operations ended in a short period of several days in a crushing Iranian defeat, reflecting crucial Iraqi supremacy at this stage of the war in the face of the Iranian weakness, which the Iraqis took full advantage of to, uh, to force them to end the war. On August 8th, both sides adopted the Security Council resolution on a ceasefire, which went into effect on the 20th of the month. The war was over. Khomeini made this decision, though he didn't achieve the victory he expected over Saddam, and he said to his generals that in order to win a war against Iraq, 
Iran needs a nuclear capability. The Iraqis celebrated the event and Saddam emerged victorious with the largest and most powerful army in the Middle East and the Arab world at their disposal. Thus ended a long and important chapter in the history of the region, which has its impact still to these days. And the rest you can find, of course, in my book, as mentioned, Wars of Modern Babylon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pesach. Thank you, Pesach, for this uh, illuminating um, lecture. Um, spending uh, the whole war in a couple of uh, minutes. It was, for those of us who still remember the war, the eight years almost seemed like eternity. But you took it into, uh, you summed, summed it up in, in 20 minutes, which is uh, really great.